Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Tesserado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that most wonderful genre ever written, Steampunk! <laughs> now today we're going to talk about a YA classic, a classic science fiction trilogy series by the British author Philip Pullman called His Dark Materials. By last time I did a video on the Chronicles of Narnia. Wonderful, wonderful series for kids. I highly recommend it. Uh, it is very, it is explicitly Christian. And uh, this is, the, this, the dark, His Dark Materials was written by Pullman as kind of a response to some things that bothered him in, in Narnia. It's kind of the anti-Narnia, and uh, so it's got some anti-religious themes in it. And yet I also I also enjoyed this one as well, and so I'm going to talk about that and, and maybe do a little bit of contrast. So the name Dark Materials, it comes from a, couple, a line in uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost. Unless the Almighty Maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Which is appropriate because this involves multiple worlds, or multiple dimensions as we would say in sci-fi. And so... Pullman was born in uh, 1946 in Norwich, England, and he's spent most of his life as a writer. I'm very jealous about that. He's been a professor and so on part-time in Oxford, uh, which makes sense because a lot of the thought of the, the Golden Compass takes place in o Oxford. And uh, but he's been a full-time writer since 1996. And anyway, the series uh, the series is popularly known in America by the name of its first book, The Golden Compass, as I already mentioned. And it was it came out in 1995, and in 1995 it won the Carnegie Medal for children's literature. So in Britain, this book is known as Northern Lights. I prefer the American title, and I'm going to tell you why, after I tell you the names of the other two members of the trilogy, Subtle Knife, uh, published in 1997, and Amber Spyglass, published in 2000. Now, do you notice anything about those two titles? They're both gadgets. <laughs> they're both, uh, you know, tools, or, or even if they're supernatural, they are tools and gadgets. And, and so is the Golden Compass. So that theme, which, as a steampunk, I love, makes me want to say Golden Compass should be the official title of all editions. <laughs> Even though Northern Lights it makes sense, but it's not as cool. Now, sometimes this series is classed as steampunk, though I, I consider it on the edge. First of all, I don't think Pullman sat out intending to write a steampunk novel. In fact, it wasn't really that popular in the, in the late 90s. I mean, there was only a few scattered books of that, you know, people like K.W. Jeter and so on. And whether even new steampunk existed is, is another question. It's just an alternate world which has kind of Victorian level technology and a lot of airships and so on. And uh, the other two books take place partly in our world and partly in other worlds. So, so the steampunk isn't there as much as, as we'd like it. Nonetheless, they're still good. Now the pro protagonist is Lyra Balakwa. She's a young orphan uh, living on the campus of Oxford in England. And uh, so she lives in the universities. The, the Dons have kind of adopted her. And uh, her name is a horrible pun, since the, her biggest character flaw is that she's a liar. <laughs> and she's always telling fibs. And uh, she has this uncle, in quotes, <laughs> Uncle uh, Azrael, Lord Azrael, and he's a world traveler. And he, uh, he appears early in the book as a uh, you know, as a presenter, he's going to do this uh, this uh, secret presentation about this wonderful discovery uh, he's made to the other professors, and uh, which Lyra secretly watches. Now, the biggest and most remarkable thing about Lyra's world is that every human has a demon, and uh, it's not like a devil, <laughs> although that would be interesting if it was. It's spelled D-A-E-M-O-N, and it means kind of like a spirit. It's like a spirit animal. The, the, these are these little, little companions that appear as an animal. And it's always with you, and other people can see it. But uh, it's, 
it's generally it's like generally your best friend, and other people aren't supposed to really react, you know, interface interact with your demon that much. And typically, when you're a child, when you're a child, your demon can shape shift. It can become any kind of any kind of uh, animal. Lyra's demon, Pantalaemon, uh, short short for short, she calls him Pan. Uh, often becomes a bug, so we can flitter around. He can be a bird. He can be a. a he's often a rodent. He seems to prefer that, uh, some sort of like a, a like a ferret, like like little cute little fuzzy guy, <laughs> and uh, and, he, and they run around Oxford playing hide seeking and all sorts of mischief, and her, and with her friend Roger, who is, I believe he's either. It's been a while since I read it, but I think he either works in the kitchens or maybe maybe. Uh, you know, maybe some of his family has connections to Oxford, but I think he works there because it's the 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 era when they had a lot of child labor, <clears throat> and and there's another interesting character, interesting and formidable character called Mrs. Coulter, who takes an interest in Lyra and ends up adopting her, <clears throat> and uh, of course she has a secret connection to Lyra, as does Lord Asriel, and they have a secret connection with each other. Part of the plot is this. This discovery of this like mystical uh, substance called dust in up, especially up north, by the aurora, where uh, Lord Azure is going to go to see it, and she's and Lyra is supposed to come along with him, and uh, instead she ends up going with Miss Coulter, living with her, and uh, it's interesting. Like, Coulter has a really cruel, like monkey-like uh, demon, <laughs> because when you are when you hit puberty, your demon takes a fixed shape, and it's supposed to kind of represent your personality. It might be a panther, it might be a butterfly, it might be a dog, it can be anything. And it's a really cool idea. And so, the uh, other thing about this world, besides being kind of Victorian, is it's it's also kind of a theocracy. There's this um, kind of a Protestant version of the papacy called the Magisterium, which is um, is in Geneva, and it kind of roots, roots out heretics. And so, some of these magisterium people are after trying to ferret out Azrael's discovery and so on. It's, it's to them it's heresy. So, <clears throat> among other things, there's like missing children. There's uh, polar bears who can talk, and they have they armor themselves and have battles, which is pretty cool. And uh, the ending of this first book is kind of a terrible tragedy, involving Lyra's best friend. By her evil uncle, Lord Azrael, who finds a way to harness the spiritual energy between a human and its demon. So the uh, second book starts in uh, st uh, begins in our world <laughs> with a kid named Will Perry. He's like 12 years old, which is about Lyra's age, and he is uh, kind of an unfortunate situation. His mother's mentally ill. His father's either dead or gone. I forget. And he has kind of kind of has to care for his mother, and he ends up. Um, I think she dies, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, and he ends up finding this passage to our to Lyra's world by using a uh, this knife that can cut in the air. It can cut a dimensional portal. You can walk through to another world, and there are many of them, so you have to know exactly how thick to cut it. So they meet and become fast friends, and so on. They have adventures. And the, and uh, they even uh, fleeing from the magisterium and so on. So on. They even uh, they even go to this world where these these giant beasts. They're like buffalo on wheels, which is one of the coolest uh, sci-fi worlds I've ever seen. Not developed as well as I would have loved. I would have loved to see more of that because it was so bizarre. And then there's the third one is the Amper Spyglass because there's this new menace. The, the specters, they're like these evil spirits that come after people. I think they steal your soul. And they are invisible to most people, but if you have this amber spyglass, which, if I remember correctly, was a just a piece of amber, you could look through it and you could see the specters and therefore be forewarned. And so that's kind of how Lyra and Will get away. They end up somehow going to the afterworld and uh, re releasing these tormented souls in this form of purgatory. And uh, there's this battle with the Almighty, who's not as Almighty as, as you would think, 
and it's all very, very metaphysical. <laughs> and there's kind of a sad ending at the end, kind of a tra not, not tragic, but poignant, you know, kind of, kind of um, disappointing if you if you like totally happy endings. So the movie adaptation, the first one, was uh, done in 2007, and uh, was very mostly good, uh, starring Nicole Kidman. I've, I've always had a crush on this woman. <laughs> Not just because she's beautiful, but also because she's perfect at fit, playing a villainess. She's just chilling. And uh, she plays Mrs. Coulter, of course, and Daniel Craig as Lord Azrael, and Dakota Blue Richards as Lyra. Mostly good. They kind of uh, they kind of accentuated the steampunk elements. These very cool carriages that ran on electric power, which they call Anbark, uh, which is also like the word Electra is also d derived from the word for amber, uh, because well, because of static electricity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the problem with this movie. Uh, it was well. It was controversial because of the anti-religious theme, which they softened. Some people were angry about that, and then religious people were angry about the overall anti-Christian motif. Uh, at the same time, fans, and including myself and my son, were really angered by the fact that they let out left out the original ending. And this was because the test audiences were so upset by the tragic ending that that they. Um, that they cut it off like shortly before the end when nothing's really happened. There's no result, resolution at all. And uh, I think they were wimps. I think if they would have understood what the fan base wanted, faithful, you know, faithfulness to the book, they would have gone with the original and probably it would have gotten better reception and probably they would have made the two sequels, which they didn't. So later on though, very recently actually in 2019, Bad Robot and New Line teamed up to produce a Dark Materials series. And it was supposed to be like three seasons, uh, each one loosely based on, them. well, I wouldn't say loosely based. They're actually closer to the novels, but they, they mix the contents of the three novels together. But the first series represents the Golden Compass slash Northern Lights, etc. The second, the, uh, the Subtle Knife. The third, the, the Amber Spyglass first two have been made, and I saw about the half of the first half of the first season, and I enjoyed it, with, with again, with certain criticisms, and the um, third hasn't been made yet, partly because of the evil, the evil coof that caused the entire world to, pa to pause for an entire year. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to call it the China flu, I'm going to call it the American flu, because I think we were the ones who made it into such a big deal. But anyway, um, because of the American flu, uh, it's been postponed, and I don't think that third season is made yet. So it's available on, if you're in England, you can see it on the BBC. Uh, here it's in HBO. And uh, it, it was interesting in that, you know, I, well, first of all, I was impressed that Ruth Wilson was as good of a mental with Mrs. Coulter, almost as good as Nicole Kidman. Very, very... Um, villainous and, and sexy in a villainous way. Uh, whereas, I thought Daphne Keene, their Lyra, Lyra, she was okay. I did like the other Lyra better. But and she did, still did a good job. Uh, the one thing I noticed, of course, being the current year and, and, uh, and uh, political correctness and all, they race swapped a lot of the characters. Which isn't too much of a problem because it's an alternate world, and so it, you, we don't have to Represent any uh, re represent all Lyra's steampunk world with any kind of historicity, historicity, and but but the Egyptians were a, a kind of a line of side characters. They are water gypsies, and I, if you were offended by that term, too bad. <laughs> I don't think there's many Romani in my audience, so I don't care. Um, but in, but you know it's it's just it's just mis people mistakenly thought that the, these people were from Egypt, which they, which they aren't. But uh, the, the Egyptians, they, they live in boats, and they, they rescue Lyra at one point, and they are mixed race, which I thought was jarring. I thought they'd be pretty much, um, they'd pretty much be all the same ethnic group. What I, you know, black and white, the actors were good, 
uh, mind you, but I think they should have had them played by South Asians. I mean, you can certainly find a lot of them in acting, and so, especially in Britain. So, uh, yeah, I think if they would have been Indian and Pakistani, uh, they would have represented more to what I imagined the Egyptians to be in the book. So other than that, other than that, like mild criticism, I, th I thought it was pretty good as far as what I've seen. Uh, so, Pullman has also written other books that take place in Lyra's world. He started a trilogy, a, a prequel trilogy, uh, called The Book of Dust. I don't know, why do people always write prequels? Why don't they write sequels anymore? And, uh, and uh, he's, two of those are up, a third not yet. And Pullman's in his 70s, so maybe he's just slowing on a bit. I haven't read either any of those prequels. I did read a companion novella called Lyra's Oxford. It was okay, meh. <laughs> Not very memorable. I can't blame him, though, for wanting to cash in on the popularity of the series. Now, overall, despite the series' flaws, I highly recommend them. I, I, I mean, I, I liked it a little bit better than Narnia. Um, I think because of its, it's aimed at a older age group. I think that's why. But both have their strengths and weaknesses. I think it's good YA, but it's not recommended, at least I wouldn't recommend it for young children because of the of the um, the violence and death in it. And uh, then in I and I guess there's some there's some hints about sexuality in there too. And I, I don't think it's suitable for young children. Now interestingly enough, I just discovered in researching this, that the British edition is different. That they, the American edition, they expurgated some of the stuff about Lyra's budding sexuality. I mean, she is actually, you know, after all going through puberty. And it, I just had to shake my head. We Americans are so puritanical about natural sexuality, and yet, you know, so we don't want to talk about teen sexuality at all. I agree in protecting children, that's very important. But, at the same time, we glorify and uh, and protect and celebrate abnormal sexuality. What's up with that? <laughs> so uh, so anyway, well, people read all sorts of stuff into that, but I don't care. I don't care. So that's the rest for John C. Wright's criticisms. I agree with some of it. The, he grudgingly admitted the first book was good, even though he hated the message, and uh, thought the third was pretty bad. I thought the third was disappointing. You know, I think, uh, I think, you know, Pullman could have done a lot more with it, and it could have been, especially the Battle in Heaven, was very underwhelming, I, I really thought. It's a problem with villains. It's a problem with villains, especially, it seems, to people on, with people on the left, who, but it may be with, all, with both sides, maybe our side, too. You, you want to portray them on one side, you want to portray them as evil and powerful, thus to be feared, but at the same time you want to portray them as uh, incompetent and stupid and, and, and so this is the way that, that God, really, seriously, God, is portrayed in the last book of the Dark Material series. It reminds me of, you know how, Hulk, remember Hogan's Heroes, if you're old enough, uh, a, a series about a, uh, Americans in a Nazi prison, prison camp, POW camp, uh, the Nazis are portrayed as bumbling and stupid. <laughs> so, you know, so you can either uh, you can either portray them as, as the consummate evil or just dummies. And that they, they chose dummies. So, as I said, I do recommend it. Uh, and uh, please let me know what you thought about the Golden Compass. Perhaps about uh, its contrast with uh, the Narnia, Chronicles of Narnia, which you liked better. Please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word. Also, check out my books. I, I will put the link in the description to at least one of my works. And uh, I greatly appreciate that. Maybe someday I'll be able to be a full-time writer just like Philip Bowman. So, for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.